Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School lesson for February 20th, 2022. This is Deacon Barry Taylor with the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church and we are still in Unit 3, which is entitled Justice and Adversity. Justice and Adversity from the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly. We are in Lesson 12, and the lesson is entitled Enduring False Charges. Enduring False Charges. Our devotional reading came from James chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Background scripture, Job chapter 8, and our printed passage, it's Job chapter 8, verses 1 to 10, and then verses 20 to 22. Our key verse is from the King James Version. Then answered Bildad the Shuhite, and said, How long wilt thou speak these things? And how long shall the words of thy mouth be like a strong wind? That is Job chapter 8 verses 1 and 2. Lesson aims from the quarterly or number 1, understand Bildad's response to Job's suffering. Number 2, carefully discern when others misinterpret God's ways. And then number 3, grow closer to God and live faithfully in God's just ways. After the introduction, our lesson has three divisions. First is entitled, A Faulty Conclusion. That's covered between Job chapter 8 verses 1 to 7. The second is entitled, Faulty Traditionalism. And that's covered between Job chapter 8 verses 8 to 10. And then final division is entitled A Faulty Verdict, and that's covered between Job chapter 8, verses 20 and 22. From the standard commentary, our lesson title is Bildad Misspeaks God's Justice. And very quickly, additional aims or number one, summarize Bildad's explanation of Job's suffering. And number two, explain the error of Bildad's conclusions. And number three, be Bildad's, uh, Bildad rather, in a role play of Im improved counseling of friends in distress. A role play, I'm sure, intended to improve counseling of friends in distress. And as I read through the lessons of the commentaries, uh, and the text, I uh, I try to pull out some main points myself that I, I'd like to accomplish in addition to those aims or along with accomplishing those aims. Um, we know the book of Job um, raises uh, one profound question, and that is uh, why God allows the righteous to suffer and evil to flourish? Um, that's, a, that's an age-old question, uh, and it's been asked uh, generation after generation, and it's something that we're not going to answer today. Uh, however, I do want to say uh, at the outset that, uh, as we know, um, those of us who've studied the Bible, all sin is going to be paid for. The evil are going to be uh, paid they're going to be, unless they accept uh, the payment that God has already made for their sins, we know what their end will be. Also, we want to look at uh, this. Uh, it's, it's, it's an age-old uh, way of thinking as well. Uh, are the blessings of God a sign of his favor? And is poverty a sign of his disfavor? Uh, that's been an age-old question. It was not only one in, throughout antiquity and among the Jews, but certain ancient Jews, but it is today. And then also um, we want to <clears throat> learn, and I think this is the most important takeaway from the lesson, how we can better help comfort those 
who are suffering for whatever reason, and we don't know uh, very often why they're suffering. We know some why they're suffering rather. Sometimes we know <clears throat> they can be self-inflicted wounds, uh, various addictions, and so forth that lead them into suffering. Uh, but other times we simply don't know, and I don't know that God wants us to to speculate or uh, or uh, on on what the cause may be. And so as we go through the lesson, we're going to try to understand how we can better, and I say better help, we, we should pray for and hope, hopefully, hopefully depend on the Holy Spirit to provide comfort uh, to be the paracletus and the, the one who walks alongside and comforts. But I believe we can be used of the Holy Spirit to comfort as well. So we're going to uh, give a little background have a, a brief word of prayer and then jump right into our lesson verse by verse so we know um those of us who uh have, have read through job uh what the background is uh the writer of job we don't know who that was there is uh, some thinking that it might have been uh moses and several others are speculated on, about uh, but we don't really know uh, who the author of Job was, but Job was a contemporary of the patriarchs, which means uh, he probably lived sometime around uh, the time that um, Abraham did. And um, it's, it says he's from the, he's from the, uh, from Ur. Uh, we don't, we, we're not told specifically where, but uh, uh he is uh, perhaps a contemporary of, again, the patriarchs Abraham, uh, Isaac, Jacob. And, and, and we know uh, that uh, God has called him uh, a perfect and upright man. And that word perfect in that context means blameless when Satan approaches him. Uh, God, we know it's from chapter one and uh, that God uh, directs uh, Satan to to Job to see him a perfect and upright man that eschewed evil uh, and then we know Satan uh, I'm not going to say provokes but he challenges God to allow him to um, inflict Job because he claims that Job only worships God because God has so richly blessed him and of course we know that Job was uh, greatest of men of his time in terms of his material wealth but Job was also a very devout uh, believing man and he, uh, he he prayed often and he offered sacrifices for his children uh, in, in case they had sinned and cursed God uh, while perhaps imbibing uh, and so we know that uh, uh, that as background uh, on uh, this situation we also know from early chapters chapter that God had allowed Satan to inflict uh, Job for first by taking uh, his material wealth uh, and 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 also God had told him not to touch Job uh, physically but he did take the lives or he um, uh, caused the lives of his children uh, to be uh, he caused the death of his children his ten children and, and, and then uh, Job, uh, of course, confessed uh, naked, uh, came he out from the womb, and naked shall he return. You know, uh, he said, uh, blessed is the name of the Lord. And he said, uh, in all this, we learned uh, early on that he did not sin or charge God with wrong. Okay, that's from verse, uh, verse 22 of, cha of chapter 1. And, and so then Satan returns to God and says, okay, uh, he, he, if, if, if you allow me to touch his body, then he'll curse you to your face. And of course, the Lord allows him to touch uh, Job's body. Uh, and he afflicted him with boils from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. Uh, and he was scraping them off with, uh, with pieces of uh, pottery. Uh, and, uh, and Job's... Uh, he uh, sat in sackcloth and ashes and still did not curse God and 
even after his wife told him to curse God and die. And then fast forwarding a little bit. So after Job had suffered a while, his friends had heard of it. Uh, three of his friends had heard of his suffering and they came to comfort him. And for the first seven days, they sat in silence with him, uh, just bemoaning his situation with him. And that was probably the best thing that they could have done. It was when they opened their mouths is when um, things started to go wrong. And we know they, in order, uh, the three friends in order, uh, up part began to speak after hearing Job lament his situation and cursing the day he was born and so forth and so on. And <clears throat> so um, Eliphaz was the first to uh, speak and of course there were exchanges. Uh, Job would lament, uh, one of his friends would speak, and then one, and then another, Job would lament or try and respond to uh, the one who had spoken, again protesting his, <clears throat> his innocence uh, and complaining before God. And finally we get to chapter eight and Bildad is going to speak. Bildad is uh, I believe he's the second to speak here. But uh, so now, so we're going to get into the lesson text here in just a minute. Father, we do thank and praise you for, Lord, yet another opportunity to study your precious word. And, and we pray, Lord, that uh, we will understand and take away from uh, this text, Lord, what you intended for us to understand, what you intended for us to take away concerning suffering, Lord, uh, when we don't know uh, the cause. Uh, Lord, and in terms of uh, trusting you, Lord, uh, whether we can see or understand uh, what you're doing or why you're doing it, Lord, to trust you uh, as Job did uh, when he stated, though he slay me, yet will I trust him, Lord. And Lord, we pray that we would learn as we go through this lesson what not to do in attempting to comfort uh, those who are suffering, Lord, to not presume to know uh your ways and your will, Lord, no matter how well studied we think we are, Lord. As you said in Isaiah, your thoughts as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are your thoughts higher than ours, Lord. We cannot understand all of your ways, Lord. You've given us, obviously, a, an understanding of your righteousness and your holiness, and we have to depend. And you've also said the judge of all the earth will do right, so we have to just depend on you, do ultimately what is right for all of us. The just and the unjust. You let you make it your rain to fall and your sun to shine on the just and the unjust, and you will be judged perfectly, Lord. So we thank you and we praise you again. Help us to understand. Help us to apply uh, this word and this understanding of this word to our lives. In Jesus' name, Amen. So the first division of um, the quarterly lesson commentary is again entitled uh, a faulty conclusion it's covered between job 8 1 to 7 uh, from the common uh, from the standard uh, that first division is entitled condemnation covered between verses 1 and 4 so we're going to read uh, and I'm going to just try to stick with the NIV uh, <clears throat> the first passage from the quarterly and then we'll back up and have some verse by verse so beginning at verse 2 it reads how long will you s I'm sorry uh, verse 1 then Bildad the Shuhite replied how long will you say such things your words are a blustering wind does God pervert justice? Does the Almighty pervert what is right? When your children sinned against him, he gave them over to the penalty of their sin. Verse 5. But if you will seek God earnestly and plead with the Almighty, if you are pure and upright, even now he will rouse himself on your behalf and restore you to your pros prosperous state. Verse 7. Your blessings will seem humble, so prosperous will your future be. In other words, the blessings that you had before will seem meager compared to how God will bless you. We're going to say more about that when we get to that verse. So, um, so let's back up to verse 1. 
uh, and it says then answered Bilhad the Shuhite and said now we don't know a whole lot about Bildad or any of his friends uh, uh, the Shuhite the designation the Shuhite could possibly be a tribal name uh, from uh, an ancient ancestor uh, he could also be a descendant of uh, Shuha, which was a child of Abraham by Keturah. You can read about that in Genesis chapter 25, verses, verse 2. Um, and he, he says, how long, how long will you say such things? Your words are a blustering wind. So, what such thing? I mean, when I read this, obviously I had I read chapter seven as well, so I knew what such things were. But obviously, when he's uh, asking Job how long he's going to um, say such things, it might be good to just go back and review some of the things that Job has said in chapter seven. And be good, just start, starting at eleven, I'm going to skip around here. He says, "Therefore will I not restrain my mouth." I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Who's he complaining to? He's complaining to God. And certainly his friends are in earshot, so they're hearing his complaints. Uh, verse 15 says, So that my soul chooses strangling and death rather than my body. 16. I loathe my life. I would not live forever. Let me alone, for my days are but a breath. Skipping down to 20. I have sinned. Uh, that's a question. Now, have I sinned, rather? Have I sinned? What have I done to you, O watcher of men? Referring to God, of course. Why have you set me as your target, so that I am a burden to myself? Why then do you pardon my why then do you not pardon my transgression? So he, he can't think of anything he's done, but if he's done anything, he's asking God, well, why don't you, you pardon my transgressions? Are you gonna, just going to, and, and take away my iniquity? You know, he, he hasn't done it intentionally, obviously. He's not aware of any sin. So that is some of what uh, Bildad is, is speaking of when he says, why are you saying such things? You sound like a blast of wind, you know? Um, and that's a pretty uh, rough and crude uh, put down uh, of, uh, of of Job. He's, he's just he's uh, not appreciating uh, fully the agony that that Job is in and the confusion that Job is in. To to suggest to, to trivialize uh, his bemoaning uh, his his uh, situation and the unjust nature what he sees as an unjust nature of his suffering. And, and, and throughout these discourses uh, between Job and his friends, uh, Job is never questioning God's sovereignty, but he does question the wisdom of his friends uh, from as he goes through these uh, discourses. And he goes on in verse 3, he says, Does God pervert justice? Does the Almighty pervert what is right? There are two things I want to point out in that verse. Uh, first of all, this word pervert uh, from the Hebrew uh, means uh, to bend or falsify or to make crooked. It means to twist, distort something. Uh, and, and what we see here in this verse is a, a parallelism. You see that in uh, the wisdom literature in the Bible uh, in the Old Testament where you see these couplings that basically say the same thing with a little different phrasing. So he says, doth God, he said, does God pervert justice? And then he turns around and says the same thing again. Does the Almighty pervert what is right? What is right is justice. So uh, that's a little coupling. You see, again, those uh, parallelisms throughout the Bible. Let's move on. Verse. So, so he's he, obviously those questions are rhetorical. He's asking Job, isn't God righteous? In other words, uh, and does, does he do anything that's not right? Okay, uh, verse 4. If 
he says, when your children, from the NIV, when your children sinned against him, he gave them over to the penalty of their sin. Now that is, that's a really low blow there. He's basically saying that your children must have sinned and God killed them. He judged them for their sin with death. Uh, and perhaps of all the losses that Job suffered, the loss of his children was most painful. And for Bildad to go there was just absolutely crass and insensitive. Uh, and, and, and obviously uh, an, an indication that he's not in any way being led by God in what he's saying to Job. Verse 5, But if you will seek God earnestly and plead with the Almighty, I'm going to take 6, If you are pure and upright, even now he will rouse himself on your behalf and restore you to your prosperous state. So what is what is he saying? He is saying, you have sinned. You yourself have sinned. Perhaps not as, obviously not as bad as your children did because he, he killed them. He didn't kill you. So you need to repent of your sin. He's saying, uh, you know, God is righteous. Uh, God is uh, compassionate. Now this is inferred. This is inferred. He says, but... Uh, you need to confess your sin and you need to repent. Repent is to have a change of heart and mind, it's uh, metanoia, uh, and uh, a change of direction. And he said, you know, you need to seek him earnestly, uh, you know, with all your heart. Plead with the Almighty. And he says, if you're pure, this is this purity comes as a result of the repentance. So, so Bildad is, is reasoning uh, and upright after you repent of course then he said even now will God right arouse himself uh, will he begin will he turn his attention to you uh, on your behalf and restore you to your prosperous state now they all knew that he was very prosperous materially and they may not have known how uh, devout he was uh, how how strong his relationship with God was before this calamity befell him. By the way, the, the King James uh, reads, uh, just quickly, he said, If thou wert pure and upright, surely now he would awake for thee and make the habitation of thy righteousness prosperous. In other words, uh, he would bless your righteousness with prosperity. Let's move on. Verse 7 says, Your beginning will be humble, so prosper, will seem humble rather. Your beginning will seem humble, so prosperous will your future be. What's he saying there? Your beginning, now his beginning was before the calamity befell him. And you know he had all these camels and all these oxen and all these sheep. And, and he was very the richest in, uh, man in that area. Uh, ten children. Uh, and, and so forth and he says that's going to seem like uh, nothing compared to how you're going to be blessed now <laughs> you, know, you guys have heard the saying every now and then uh, even a blind squirrel will find a nut well uh, he is actually speaking uh, prophetically here and little does he know it but God is going to restore twice what he had before he allowed Satan to attack him. Uh, except for the the ten children, he's going to give him ten additional children, but uh, the other ten, uh, or we believe, are in heaven at this point. So um, he's speaking prophetically and not even knowing it. And uh, so now we're going to move into the second uh, division of the quarterly, which reads. Um, faulty traditionalism now the commentary talks about um, Bildad being a traditionalist which means he relies more heavily on uh, the traditions and <clears throat> what uh, uh, predecessors and ancestors believed and thought than, than the present and he and let, let's get into the text here and this is covered between verses 8 and 10 and we'll read again from the NIV 
ask the former generation and find out what their ancestors learned. For we were born only yesterday and know nothing, and our days on earth are but a shadow. Will they not instruct you and tell you? Will they not bring forth words from their understanding? So he is appealing or he is uh, asking uh, Job to look at the traditions. What, what have our forefathers taught us concerning suffering? And, you know, I think he's being disingenuous uh, while... Uh, it it may be um, it, it's easy to think it was easy to think then and it's easy to think now that our suffering has to be a result of something that we've done uh, God is allowing a suffering in our lives because we have sinned or we caught because we've been unrighteous but at the, but at the same time we all know uh, through living that uh, we see uh, righteous people I mean presumably righteous we don't we don't have they're blameless at least as far as we're concerned suffer and we see uh, the rich or evil rather the evil flourish uh, I mean we could go to examples of that in the uh, in the New Testament one of the questions in the uh, uh, standard here is in what ways do you th link material wealth with God's blessing and it asks if, you, if there's some scriptures, uh, uh, what scriptures contradict doctrines that suggest God always gives wealth to those he favors. Now, we won't go, go to the specific text, but uh, we know Lazarus and the rich man, you know, Lazarus laid at the rich man's gate and uh, the rich man wouldn't give him crumbs. He fared sumptuously and the dogs licked Lazarus' wounds and and, 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 and Lazarus went, in, went to be, uh, died and, and, and went into Abraham's bosom. Lazarus died and he was in a place of torment. So we know that uh, that's uh, one instant. The widow who did the, the Lord Jesus praised, who gave more than all those who were uh, uh, just uh, putting uh, great amounts of wealth into the coffers at the temple, the widow who gave two mites, which make a farthing, uh, the Lord Jesus said, gave more than than all uh, uh, the others because she gave all her living. She was, I would think, devout and righteous, but she was poor. And we could give countless examples of, of poor and rich. You know, the patriarchs were very wealthy, uh, but they were also uh, uh, devout uh, before the Lord. So uh, let's, let's move on now. So verse verse 8 we're going to back up to verse 8 and it says ask the former generation and find out what their ancestors learned okay so the former generation would be I guess the more immediate uh, ancestors and then what they learned from their fathers and their fathers and their fathers tradition in other words and again it looks like uh, what Bill Dad is saying here is that, hey we, we haven't been here long verse 9 we just we were born yesterday. We don't know anything. So we have to uh, follow the traditions. What have we been told? We've been told by, again, our forefathers that uh, if you do evil, uh, uh, then God is going to punish you. If you're a sinner, he's going to punish you. And if you prosper, he is going to bless you. <clears throat> now, that was it was very common of the Jews uh, to uh, believe that. Okay, to believe that uh, in Jesus' day. Uh, and uh, in fact, in, in even before the first advent uh, throughout the Old Testament, uh, the Jews believed that. And, and you may not realize it, but folk believe that today, at, that if you are materially blessed, then you must be doing something right before God. In fact, that's a, that's a common phrase. Uh, and if you are poor or if you're suffering, there must be something. You must be doing something wrong. There must be sin in your life. But neither of those um, are, 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 are always the case or may not be the, the case at all. And we see countless cases of, uh, well, we, we see prophets and we see others in the Psalms and Habakkuk who ask God, you know, the, the question, why do the, the evil seem to flourish and the righteous suffer? And God, when God answered Habakkuk, 
uh, he didn't like the answer when God told Habakkuk he was going to judge uh, Israel uh, or with Babylon or Judah with Babylon and then he was going to later judge Babylon and and Habakkuk said hey they're more wicked than we are but God uh, again I said at the outset uh, God is going to be the perfect judge of the just and the unjust and we can count on that okay we're going to uh, move on here um, And, and the other thing I should say is that, I mean, God is going to judge fairly and in his own time, okay? God doesn't settle all accounts in a day. Uh, we we sometimes wonder, uh, I, I know when I was out in the world, uh, why the, the Lord allowed me uh, to, to even survive that period, you know, but I, I'm so thankful uh, that he did and that uh, uh, he, he brought me into uh, a state of grace and acceptance of his love, his grace. And so we, we, we don't want to, to think that, that God uh, is overlooking anything when we see uh, the evil flourish or seem to flourish and the righteous suffer. And, and throughout this discourse, uh, Bildad is, is being very presumptuous and, and what he learned from his fathers and forefathers was as well and that is that we can know God's ways when it comes to uh, suffering or what he is doing in the lives of other people and that's something we don't want to be presumptuous about and as I said regardless of how well how, how, how studied we are how much we think we know of God's word now obviously uh, we can give wise counsel when we see someone is doing something that's destructive but this is something else. When someone is suffering through no apparent fault of their own, uh, this is something that uh, we want to hopefully speak to in a few minutes, how we can be of comfort to those people. Okay, let's move into the last division here, which is entitled Faulty Traditionalism. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was the one I just finished. Uh, the last, the third division is entitled A Faulty Verdict, and that's covered between verses 20 and 22. And it reads, surely God does not reject one who is blameless or strengthen the hands of evildoers wrong. Um, he will yet fulfill your mouth with laughter and your lips with shouts of joy. Your enemies will be clothed in shame and the tents of the wicked will be no more. Now, I, I, I kind of quipped at the first verse there because it says, again, behold, God will not cast away the, or will not reject the one who is blameless. And it depends on what you are perceiving as rejection. The suffering, if you're calling that rejection of God, then you're wrong. Okay, he's wrong here. Or strengthen the hands of evil doers. If you mean by that that God is not going to allow the evil doers to prosper, you're wrong on that. He's wrong on that count as well. So, so Bildad continues with um, assumptions about God's justice. You know, um, and 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 again, we've talked about the the blamelessness now. Job was not without sin. I want to say that he he didn't have any known sin, any unconfessed sin, and therefore he was he was blameless. No one could accuse him of any sin or any unconfessed sin, and that's what we <coughs> want to strive to be. We're not going to be sinless. We know we're not going to be perfect, but we want to be perfect in the in the in the literal sense that that, that we understand it. But we want to be blameless. Now he is. Uh, He's really uh, looking at Job's tragedies and concluding that uh, that the I mean just the opposite, you know that uh, and and he basically uh, one of the commentators, the standard commentator, offers a syllogism here, uh, basically which is a uh, the framework of Bildad's thinking, the major premise of his thinking here is that God does not cast away those who are perfect or blameless. He doesn't, in other words, he does not suffer, judge them or allow them to suffer. 
specific premise, that's a major premise, the specific premise is God has cast Job away uh, as evidenced by Job's troubles or his suffering. Okay, and then the conclusion that Bildad is making here is that Job is not perfect or blameless and therefore needs to repent. Now, while Bildad doesn't come out uh, and use that word, repent, he is saying, plead with the Lord, go, go, you know, confess and so forth, uh, and the Lord will restore you. So he is basically telling him to repent. He needs to repent. He is not blameless, and therefore he needs to repent. Now, you, if you've read Job, you know throughout Job, Job is protesting his innocence. He said, if I've done something just show me, you know. He said, "Lord, just just tell me, speak to me," and, and he's pleading with the Lord to show him uh, what he's done. Now, I I need to back up for just a minute uh, and, and and say I said something earlier on and I wanted to follow up on, and that is that the Jews um, had this thinking that hey, if, if they if they were faithful to God, kept the law, they would be blessed, and if they didn't. Uh, then they would be cursed. And, and, and much of that uh, they got from Deuteronomy, from the Old Testament, from Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy uh, uh, chapter 28, verses 1 to 14, basically promises uh, that they will be blessed in the land, of course, if they were obedient to God's law. Okay, it does. And then verse the second part of that uh, chapter, verses 15 to 68, says, hey, they're going to be cursed if they are disobedient to God's law. And, and, and certainly that is true. However, how God, God's timing and how God does that blessing and cursing is entirely in his purview. Okay, that's the thing. We don't want to presume that someone is suffering because they've been disobedient to God's word or will or that they're prospering because they've been obedient. All right. Now let me let me go back to where I was. I was at verse twenty, and uh, I think we, we want to realize that many of the Old Testament, uh, uh, several of the Old Testament prophets, uh, spoke to um, this uh, uh, paradox, if you will, evil flourishing or, or evil, and then the righteous. Uh, seeming to suffer or be suffered. Jeremiah, we can look at Jeremiah 12 and verse 1, Malachi 3 and 15. And actually the Lord Jesus quotes, I believe it's Jeremiah as well in Matthew 5, 45, when he says, you know, uh, the, the just and the unjust receive rain and sunshine. Okay. Uh, he makes his rain is the fall and his sun to shine on the just and the unjust. So, um, uh, Again, God is going to, we, we want to keep this in mind, just burn this in your mind. God is always going to judge perfectly fairly, but in his own time, okay? Verse 21. Uh, I'm sorry, I, did I read 20? Yeah, I read 20. Uh, 21. He will yet fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with will shout for joy. In other words, God is going to restore joy to your life uh, after you repent, after you confess your sin, which Bildad is certain that he has committed, and and and, uh, and repent. Uh, and then verse 22 says, your enemies will be clothed in shame, and the tents of the wicked will be no more. Now again, he is speaking prophetically, unknowingly, because God is going to chastise them uh, when we get over to verse 42, when you get over to verse 42, for not speaking what was right concerning him. As a matter of fact, let's turn over there for just a minute. Now before I get to the passage where God chastises uh, Job's comforters, I, you know, Job, Job really earnestly questioned God as to why he was suffering. Uh, he really wanted to know, but he did it the right way. He didn't do it uh, presumptuously in a way that was sinful. So beginning at verse 1 of 42, it reads, Then Job answered the Lord and said, 
I know that you can do anything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You ask, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Listen, please, and let me speak, you said. I will question you, and you shall answer me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Okay, and then uh, the Lord, and therefore rather, uh, verse 6, therefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Now verse 7 is, is when the Lord speaks to Job and his friends. And so it was after the Lord had spoken these words to Job that the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, my wrath is aroused against you and your two friends for you have not spoken of my of me rather what is right you have not spoken what is right of me he says as my servant job has now therefore take for yourselves seven bulls and seven rams go to my servant job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering for my servant job shall pray for you for I will accept him, lest I deal with you according to your folly. <laughs> he says, because you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. And we don't want to be guilty of the same thing when we are attempting to comfort someone who is suffering or to give them any counsel. We don't want to take God's word out of context. We don't want to be uh, the think that we know the word so well that we can uh, presume what God's will is in a, in a certain situation. This is my feeling and my thinking about this, and this is based on, on my study of the word. I think we should encourage, uh, first of all, speak only as much as necessary when we're trying to comfort someone. Sometimes our silent presence can can be enough, okay? Uh, speak led by the Holy Spirit only that which we are confident will comfort not uh, aggravate not be accusatory but only that which will comfort and direct I believe we want to continually uh, encourage the sufferer to continue to trust God no matter what no matter how difficult the circumstances we want to uh, encourage them to continue to trust God. And I, I uh, our devotional reading uh, was from uh, James chapter 1, uh, the first four verses. And, 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 and James says something that really at first takes people aback when he says to count it all joy. Uh, and then, then it reads, James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings my brethren count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations knowing this or trials knowing this that the trying of your faith worketh patience but let patience have her perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire wanting or lacking nothing now you can you can quote that or you can quote uh, Romans 8 28 all things work together but you don't want to do that unless unless they will comfort otherwise uh, they may make uh, the sufferer uh, feel worse okay you, you want to be guided by the Holy Spirit in the use of his word and as I said only speak as much as is necessary and don't presume to know why they're suffering but encourage them to trust God through the suffering. That is my advice, and I and I and I hope to heed it myself uh, when I encounter those who are suffering. So I hope that we have uh, understood this lesson. Job is uh, is is really a book that uh, is uh, it's, it's difficult to understand in in a sense. Uh, don't know why uh, God would allow Satan to. Uh, uh, cause Job to suffer. However, we don't. We, we really don't want to question that, because God 
is God. And his thoughts are not our thoughts. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts as the heaven is above the earth. And so we know that God had a reason for that. And I think countless people have been blessed by reading the trials of the trials that Job went through, uh, the suffering that he suffered yet maintained while maintaining his faith. He said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. So Job was a great, has been a great example of faith, the faith that God desires to see throughout millennia. So I, so I trust again that we've learned a little more about, about Job and hopefully how to comfort those who are suffering. So we pray that God will bless you keeping his loving care until we meet again.